The reading before the lesson this morning will come from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 34. And I'll be reading from the New King James. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Whether we believe it or not, worship is a salvation issue. The Samaritan woman at the well said to Jesus in John chapter 4 beginning verse 20, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now that settles it right there. When the Son of God said must, that solves it. And it must be in spirit and in truth. He didn't say or. He said and. It must be in spirit and it must be in truth. Now broadly speaking, Worship can be defined as the expression of devotion to deity, but not all expressions of devotion are acceptable. For example, Jesus himself condemns vain worship in Matthew 15, 9. The inspired apostle Paul condemns will worship in Colossians 2, 23, and Paul again condemns ignorant worship in Acts 17 and verse 23. We desire, therefore, to be the true worshiper, Practicing true worship. True worship involves at least these four things. Number one, we must have the correct authority. The correct authority is the New Testament. Number two, we must have the correct attitude. That's what Jesus meant when he said in spirit. Our attitude, our minds must be in the right place. Number three, we must have the correct actions. That's what Jesus meant when he said in truth, there are five avenues of worship, not six, not seven, and not four. And then number four, all that leads us to accountability. True New Testament worship is designed by God to help keep us from apostasy. Brethren, are we worshiping correctly? Brethren, are we worshiping correctly? If it's in truth but not in spirit, it's wrong. If it's in spirit but it's not in truth, guess what? It's wrong. It takes both. So today, the sermon is entitled, Let a Man Examine Himself. And really what we're going to do today is talk about worshiping God in spirit. There are three things we want to discuss today, and here's the first one. We're going to deal with self. Question, why am I here? You do understand that no one can answer that question for you except you. 
Now I want to ask you a few questions and then try to get a Bible answer as we go through. Here's, here's a question regarding the self. Who am I trying to please? Men or God? Now, let me give you a news flash. If anyone here is here only to please another human being, God is not pleased. If you're here this morning to appease your spouse, and that's the only reason why you're here, God is not pleased with you. Are you aware of that? Now, I don't think that's a big shock, really, to anybody. We, we understand that. Now, my children are here because they're my children. They're not Christians, and they don't have yet a say in life as to what they are or are not going to do. They're mine. I'm here. They're with me. Now, the answer to their question may be because Dad said so. All right? Now, they're children. And they don't have much of a say yet, but the day will come when they do have a say. And my duty right now is probably the same as yours. I want to influence my children as much as I can so that when they have a choice, they'll make the correct choice. And they'll be here not to please men, but to please God. Now, you do understand people are fickle. If you think you're going to please people, they're fickle. What does that mean? That means they can adore you today and despise you tomorrow. I've read the Bible. Have you? Are you not aware that within the time frame of about a week, the Jews went from shouting, Hosanna in the highest to Jesus in Matthew 21, 9, to let him be crucified, his blood be on us and on our children, Matthew 27, 22 to 25. Dealing with the same person and the same people in, within the time frame of about a week. So within a week's time, they were as happy and they loved Jesus as much as they ever probably did. And then about seven days later, they said, kill him. Get him, get him gone. He needs to die. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you the good thing. If you're here to please God, God is not fickle. God is unchanging. Malachi 3, 6, Hebrews 13, 8. In view of the fact that God does not change, it is far easier to please God than it is to please mankind. Do you know why that is? You know all you have to do to be pleasing to God? Read His Word and go do what He says. And guess what? God is pleased. Now you know what people can do? They'll tell you what they expect out of you today and tomorrow it may not be the same thing. They're liable to change their mind just like they did with Jesus. Hosanna, let him be crucified. Same people within a week. Open your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 1. And the Apostle Paul understood this principle very well. So look with me in Galatians chapter 1. And let's begin in verse number 10. The question was, who am I trying to please? Men or God? If you're here to please men, it won't last. But if you're here to please God, you can please Him, and you can know that you're pleasing to Him. Galatians 1, beginning in verse 10. Now, this is after Paul's already said there's only one gospel. And he's let it be known. If somebody's not preaching this one gospel, they're wrong. And if you go off and obey a false gospel, you're wrong. Verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul came from a strongly Jewish background. And you know what he went and preached? You all killed Jesus. And in view of that, you need to repent and be baptized and let the blood of Jesus Christ wash away your sins. So if he wanted to please men, he knew what to say to them. But he says, you know what? It's going to come down to it. Am I going to please men or am I going to please God? And he made his choice. He's going to please God. Verse number 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. That's a subtle way of saying I'm an inspired individual. And verse 12 makes it even clearer. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that lets you know that the things that Paul said that people took offense to, guess what? He didn't make that up. That came by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, with regard to worship, are we following the revelation of Jesus Christ? Or are we doing 
the doctrine, following rather, the doctrines and commandments of men. Paul said it this way in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4. He made it clear that everything that he did, everything that he did, especially while under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it was not to please men. Meaning that if a man was happy with it, okay. If a man is unhappy with it, guess what? You're not mad at Paul. You're mad at God. Now, let's ask another question. What am I doing while I'm here? Am I focusing on worshiping God or am I doing something else? Now, who can answer that question? Only you can answer that question. Your spouse cannot answer that question for you. It is an individual thing. True worship is a skill that must be developed. Do you believe that? True worship is a skill that must be developed. Now, surely we understand that distractions are going to occur. What do you mean? Babies are going to cry. Can you control when a baby is going to cry? I don't think you can. People are going to cough. Can you control when people are going to cough? People are going to get up and fidget and move around. Can you control all that? No, you can't. So there are going to be distractions that occur. But what do we have to do? We have to discipline our minds to stay focused on the task at hand. Whether it is singing, we focus on singing. Whether it is prayer, we focus on the prayer. When it's on the Lord's Supper, we focus on the Lord's Supper. When it's on the contribution, we focus on the contribution. And yes, even during the sermon. This is not the time to sleep. This is the time to focus on the avenue of worship at hand. It takes five, and all five must be in spirit and in truth. Not, says Brock, says the Lord. He solved that. He settled that a long time ago. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15, we're to pray with the spirit and with the understanding. We're to sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. Now, is that not true with the Lord's Supper? Is that not true with the contribution? Is that not true with the sermon? I mean, is it just only apply to prayer and singing? I don't think anybody really believes that. I really don't. But perhaps they simply haven't thought about it. It applies, brethren, to all five. Now, what does it mean? You're about to hear another section of Scripture quoted, and it's not going to be the first time you've heard it, but what does this section of Scripture mean? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 5-8. through 8. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Now, that's a, that's a broad, broad question. But I'll give you some, something to think about. When Jesus had nails in his hands and in his feet, after he had been scourged mercilessly by, most likely, Roman soldiers, he still could discipline his mind enough to quote Scripture from the cross. Now, do you understand the point that I'm trying to make? We're to have the mind of Christ. If that doesn't imply a disciplined mind, what does it imply? Now, if Jesus could have the wherewithal to quote Scripture with nails in his body, a crown of thorns shoved down on his head, I can focus through a crying baby. All right? I can focus through someone sneezing. That's not going to break my concentration. Do you understand that? If Jesus could do those things in that condition, how can we not discipline ourselves to worship God in spirit? How is it that every little thing that happens, we got, we got to look around, around. Everything distracts us. Brethren, that cannot be. We have to deal with self. But now let's move on. Question number two really deals with sin. Have I made things right? 
So I want to ask you two more questions. Number one, am I right with my brethren? Now we want to worship God in spirit, don't we? Am I right with my brethren? We've previously determined from the scriptures that worship, especially when we commune at the Lord's table, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, goes at least three ways. Upward. Am I in fellowship with God? But it goes outward. Am I right with my brethren? But then it turns inward. Am I right with myself? Am I content with the things that I've done with myself? Especially regarding the gospel. Now any person who feels that they can have full and unbroken fellowship with God while remaining at odds with their brethren obviously hasn't considered the words of our Lord. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 5. And let's look first at Matthew 5 verses 23 and 24. I'm afraid, brethren, sometimes we think that the only thing we have to do is make things right with God. Now listen, we do have to make things right with God, but it's not only with God. If so, what is the Son of God teaching right here? Matthew 5, beginning in verse 23. Jesus says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath all against thee, you remember. Now he's using perhaps an Old Testament illustration, but it obviously has New Testament application. We don't come to the altar, but we do present ourselves before the Lord in worship, don't we? That principle hasn't changed. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. What does the Son of God say? What does he say? He says first. What does first mean? When you get around to it. When the urge hits. He said first. First be reconciled. Make friends again with thy brother. Which brother? The one that has a problem with you. First be reconciled to thy brother and then. If that's not an order, what is it? Then come and offer thy gift. Now we offer spiritual sacrifices today. Do you understand that? Our sacrifices are of a spiritual nature, not necessarily of a literal nature. We offer spiritual sacrifices. What does that mean? That means when there's something wrong with brethren, we go make it right. Or are we just going to say, you know what? It don't matter what they think. That's not what Jesus teaches. Is that what he teaches? We have to make things right with one another. But I want to give you another passage. Look in Matthew 18. There may be brethren who are offended over everything all the time. Are you aware that the Son of God has placed a responsibility on them? Are you aware of that? <laughs> Communication, brethren, is paramount. How can we correct things which we have no idea of which we have no clue of anything about. Do we really expect one another to be mind readers? I'm going to answer that. I believe the answer is yes. We expect everybody to read our minds. Well, guess what? Jesus don't. He doesn't expect it. Prove it, preacher, right here. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, what does, what does he say? Go and tell his neighbor. No, that's not what he said. Go and tell the elders. No, I don't believe that's what it said either, is it? Is that what it said? Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Is that what Jesus said? Then it's settled, isn't it? <laughs> if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That's step number one. Jesus doesn't say, hey, I expect everybody to read everybody else's mind. That's not what Jesus teaches. What does he say? If you have a problem, where do you run? You don't run off and go start telling everybody in the whole world where you go. You go to the one you have a problem with. And most of the time, I still believe, it won't have to go any farther than that right there. It'll be worked out because most of the time, it's a miscommunication. But, just in case it isn't, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. That is... In the mouth of two or three witnesses, witnesses, every word may be established. Guess what? Some people ain't going to listen to that. So the Lord obviously here speaking prophetically. This obviously had an application when the Lord said it, but it's ultimately fulfilled in the church. And if he shall neglect to hear them, 
tell it unto the church. Now, if church means building, how do you explain that verse? Church doesn't mean building. It means people, doesn't it? Tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Meaning, at that time, you're just going to have to withdraw fellowship. That's going to have to be what it is. Now, question number two regarding sin. Am I right with God? You know, in order to worship God in spirit, you have to be right with God. Has the Lord added you to his church? Matthew 16, 18, Acts 2, 47. How do you feel about these scriptures? These are generally a pretty good litmus test to see if you've made things right with God. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16, 16. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, 38. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.21 Have you obeyed those scriptures? Well, that's a pretty good starting point, isn't it? I would say that most of us in here today are probably have probably obeyed those verses. And we understand those verses accurately and we have impl and accurately implemented them. Thus we are children of God. But are you aware that there's more to the gospel than hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized? <laughs> There's one, there's one more broad aspect, and that is remain faithful. Now, how do we remain faithful as children of God? Part of that is in Acts 8, 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God. If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those are directed to children of God. Now what happens if I've obeyed the gospel and I haven't repented and confessed my sins as a Christian? You're in trouble. You're not right with God. That is as an obligatory aspect of the gospel as baptism. Do you understand that? You have to be baptized correctly, but as Christians, when we sin, we have to repent. And we have to pray in order to remain pleasing to God. I've seen, and perhaps you have too, at various congregations through the years, when the men meet out front, they'll confess sin. I've never seen that here, not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent, but I have seen that. Some people understand that before they come in the presence of God, they have to be right with one another, and they have to be right with God. Now that's something to think about, brethren. Number three. There are some scary aspects to this. Very scary. And we're going to look at them and we're going to talk about them. What if I haven't worshipped in spirit and in truth? What if my attitude was right but my actions were wrong? You're wrong. What if my actions were right but my attitude was wrong? Listen, you're wrong. And by wrong, I mean you're in sin. You're in trouble. Turn with me to our scripture reading in 1 Corinthians 11. There's a command given here, and the command is really discernment. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 28 and 29. It says, but let a man examine himself. That has to do with something going on between your two ears. It doesn't say, let a man examine another man, does it? It says, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for... He that eateth and drinketh unworthily. That has nothing to do with the person, but with the manner in which, the, specifically, the Lord's Supper is partaken. Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning. Not discerning. What does that imply? We need to discern the Lord's body. Now, in order to discern the Lord's body, our attitudes and actions must harmonize with the authority of God's Word. Brethren, John 4, 24 is still in the Bible, isn't it? Has anybody taken that out of the Bible yet? What did the Son of God say? Must in spirit and in truth. You cannot say, well, I've got the truth. I don't have to worry about the spirit. That's wrong. Or you, you could say, I've got the right attitude, but I don't have to worry about the truth. That, listen, that's wrong. Why? That's what Jesus said. Must be in spirit and in truth. 
We must worship God in spirit. That means rationally, sincerely, and genuinely. Our worship must not be ritualistic or ceremonial. Brethren, we cannot get into the habit of, well, let's just say a prayer before the Lord's table and then we'll just take this bread and drink this through the vine and not even and think about where we're going to eat when we're done. That's wrong. That's wrong. It cannot. That is not worshiping God in spirit. So says who? I'm not the spirit police. That's what the Son of God says. But we must almost also worship in truth. That refers to the outer man. That refers to our actions. That which we can prove from the inspired pages of the New Testament. So just look at it this way. Spirit has to do with the inner man. In truth has to do with the outer man. That which we see. I know that we have worshipped in truth today. I know that. Why? Because I, I, mean, I can see. I don't know who took the Lord's Supper or didn't. But I'll assume that the faithful Christians in here partook of the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is right. So I know that we have worshipped in truth. What I do not know is who's worshipped in spirit. The Lord has to determine that. He's the one that is the great heart knower. Not me and not any other man. Brethren, that's why a man must examine himself. Now, I want to give you three consequences. Consequence number one is defilement. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. It, it, is that not a scary statement? I mean, serious, is that not a scary statement? Why do you think that's in the Bible? Because the first century church at Corinth they had the right actions. We'll give them that much, though probably they didn't all the way. But the Lord's Supper was right. But they were abusing the Lord's Supper. And many times when your attitude is off, it's going to reflect itself in your actions. And that's exactly what happened in Corinth. Now, Jesus' body was pierced. And his blood was shed because of sin. Are you aware of that? So what does it mean to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord? Thus, to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord is to be guilty of sin. Are you aware that if we don't partake worthily that we sin when we eat of that bread and drink of that cup, even though it, the action is right? If something is off in our minds, we're in trouble. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us what happens with sin. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Boy, wouldn't that be a shame for a Christian to commit sin while taking the Lord's Supper? Who ever heard of such? Right there. That's scary, brethren. If we don't do this correctly, consequence number two is damnation. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily. That means you haven't discerned the Lord's body. You're more concerned about golden corral than you are the Lord's supper. You're in trouble. You're in trouble with the Lord. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily. Now, the eateth and the drinketh is the right action. But that unworthily, that's not in spirit. That makes everything wrong. Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Not on me. Not on your spouse. On you. To himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. Wrong attitudes cancel out right actions. When are we going to grasp that? When are we going to see that? Have we convinced ourselves that because we have the same five correct actions that it does not matter what's going through our minds while those five avenues of worship are occurring? You didn't get that from the Bible. You did not get that from the inspired pages of the New Testament because it takes both in spirit and in truth. Consequence number three is deficiency. 
know what happens when you don't worship in spirit and in truth? Something's wrong. Something's wrong all week long. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 30. For, here's the reason. This cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. The idea seems to be that you're dead. You're alive in the flesh and you're walking and your heart's pumping and the blood is circulating through your body, but it's wrong. Spiritually speaking, things are wrong. Understand that true worship is both or it is neither. It is in spirit and in truth. If it is one or the other, it's wrong. You understand that? The action of partaking of the Lord's Supper is right. That's right. But not a soul, not one soul, can control what's going on in your mind while that avenue of worship is occurring. Only you can control that. We can blame this, we can blame that, but the Lord disciplined himself to quote Scripture with nails in his and a crown of thorns on his head. Can we not focus for an hour, an hour plus? We can't as grown adults who've been Christians 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. We have never learned to discipline ourselves. Do things just not feel right? Is there a constant uneasiness in your life? Could it be? And I'm not the judge, I don't know. Could it be that we've been worshiping in truth but not in spirit? The Lord will determine that when we breathe our last breath or when he comes again in glory. According to the only begotten Son of God, true worship must be offered in spirit and in truth. He didn't say or. 1 Peter 2.5 makes it clear that when we offer spiritual sacrifices to God, we're built up a spiritual house. What happens when you build one thing wrongly in a house? You're going to probably have a problem, aren't you? We may have all the truth lined up, but what about the Spirit? I don't mean Holy Spirit. I mean something that's going on within our minds on an individual, personal level. You know how it begins to worship God really in spirit? You have to offer Him your life. Have you offered the Lord your life? Let me give you God's test of honesty. And you're going to have to determine this. You're going to have to determine. Have I done these things? Have I done these things for the reason that the Lord wants me to do them? Or am I trying to please my spouse? Am I trying to please my mama, my daddy, my grandma, somebody? It won't last. But when you build on the rock, it'll last. Hear the truth, Acts 18, 8. Believe the truth, Acts 16, 21. 31, rather. Repent of sin, Acts 17, 30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. And brethren, we have to remain faithful. Part of remaining faithful is to repent and confess that sin to God when we have sinned as Christians, Acts 8, 22. Wherever you are, come now. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.